What's going on my friends? This is Dustin Stelzer with Electrician U and today we're going to talk about installing recessed cans. Alright, a recessed can is this guy. This is a new construction can, meaning there's no sheetrock up on anything. All you have is wood frame, uh, and you take this thing and hammer these nails into a piece of wood and hammer these ones in and it stays up in the ceiling. It's a new construction can. Um, there are remodel cans, which if they're sheetrock, you can cut a hole and they're shaped a little bit differently. I mean, they still got a box where all the wire goes. They still got the can itself that is where the light bulb goes but they don't have this whole, you know, like tray or flange or whatever the hell you call this uh, on them because this would get in the way of trying to smash it into a hole. So uh, first let's talk about new construction cans. So say we're gonna put a, uh, a new can up or a, we have like four cans in a room that we wanna put up. Um, first thing that you do is you match these tabs up. There's a little lip not all brands come with a lip. Some of them are just a flat piece here. What you would do is match this little flange up with the truss above you. And so like, we'll just pretend this is a truss above my head. Uh, you take this little flange and you match it up on the bottom. And it's really important because sheetrock's gonna go here. It's important that you keep it flat. You don't want, you know, if this is your truss, you don't wanna be hanging down like this because when they put sheetrock up, you're gonna be in the way of the sheetrock. So making sure that those flanges are set flat against the bottom of that truss. Then you're gonna hammer each one of these in place. I typically will hammer both, uh, you know, both on one side, on one truss, I'll hammer those first and then I'll extend these out and I'll hammer them on the other side. What I do is I make sure that the can is pushed all the way up against the truss and then I'll nail it in. And then your other truss is about 16 inches over on the other side. Then I will extend the legs out and push this all the way to the other side and hammer those in because that ensures that everything stays relatively straight you don't have this like wonky thing or it's not you know you're not crooked um, and then you can move the can because these things slide you move the can to wherever you need it but uh, that's just my my method now there are going to be situations where these legs are too long sometimes a can has to go in a very specific area and you've got two trusses that are like 10 inches apart well, what you do is you notice that there's little, these little notches on the legs of this can. Um, both the inside and outside piece have notches and you can actually cut these. Uh, you have to take both of these apart, cut them down to the size you need and smash them back together. And that's how you would get the legs to be a lot shorter. Um, and you can fit it into more tight spaces. Sometimes you run into a situation where the chase that you're putting it in between these two trusses is longer than the legs. These legs are typically about 24 inches uh, wide. So sometimes you might have trusses that are like this far apart. So what do you do? Well, you have to block for that. You have to put a couple more two by fours to bring it out to give yourself something to nail to. So um, that's what you do if, if they're too short or too long. Now, once you've got this up in a ceiling, you wanna make sure that you tighten the screws. Most cans come with screws on at least one side, but this screw secures this leg so that the can can't slide when it's up in the ceiling. If the sheetrock guys start slamming sheetrock up, or if anybody's above walking and they like nick this, you don't want that can moving at all. You want it to stay exactly where you want it to be. Um, a lot of them have two screws, this one doesn't, but uh, they'll have a screw on each side so you can do that. If you ever lose a screw or you don't have one around, what I do is take my clines and I just pinch uh, every single one of these tabs and I will make sure through a different means that that thing's not going to move anywhere. Um, so there's little, you know, tricks and tips that you can use for that. Um, but just making sure that that can doesn't move is the most important. Another thing when you're working with cans, when you're putting them up, I like to face all of my junction boxes the same way. So if I've got a row of like six of these things, I will put this junction box on every single one of them facing the same way. And I'm gonna make sure that wherever I'm putting them, I flip it to the side that has the most room for me to work. The last thing you want is to be up in some tiny little corner and trying to reach in here when all you had to do was turn the thing around and you got three feet of room over here to sit and work on. 
And then the other thing I do if it's not in a line, if there's four cans together, is I point the junction boxes at each other. So the two on this side of the room, I'll face the same direction, and then the two on the other side of the room, I'll face towards them. That's just less wire that you have to use, and you're running in between kind of the shortest points possible. So probably more of an anal retentive thing than anything. You don't have to do that. There's certain situations you might have two different styles of cans that are going in a room and it's not going to work, but it's just having a reason that you're doing everything you're doing is really important. And that's just something that I do. I make sure that they all face each other. So once you've got your can up in the ceiling, you're going to have to run wire to it. And you want to make sure that the wire is secure. So this can, for instance, has a couple of different options of securing the wire. It's got these half inch knockouts that you could put a Romex connector in. Um, you could put a half inch bushing in, any kind of approved method of securing the wire into this thing so it can't be pulled out. Um, but then there's also these little tiny tabs here that will fit one piece of Romex or one wire. And inside, if you look, there's these kind of metal tabs. So when you slide the wire in there, it keeps that wire from being able to be pulled out. So whatever you do, just make sure that the wire is secured to this uh, box. This is act that's actually code. You can't have something where you can just pull wire out of the box. It has to be secured. Um, the next thing is once you leave here, you need to staple within 12 inches of this junction box. So that's another way to secure. That's code as well. Um, so making sure that your wire is, is securely put in the junction box. And then what I do is once I've come out of here and stapled it, I leave a loop. And it, it can be a loop in any direction, doesn't matter, but the incoming and outgoing wires, I leave probably about an extra 12 inches. Um, and I make sure if there's a roof or like a floor above me that I don't let that loop hit that other floor because a nail can go through it or something. So I usually bring it kind of like out here somewhere. You don't have to do that again. Some places the inspectors probably won't want you leaving a loop. I've run into situations like that where inspectors like, that's an unsecured cable or something weird, even though it's stapled, you know, within code everywhere that it's supposed to be stapled. They just don't like it for some reason. Some people you work for may think it's wasting wire and they don't want you to do that. The reason I do it is because I do a lot of custom homes, big houses, really rich, fancy, you know, nice houses. And those kind of people like to change their minds a lot. So if you leave an extra loop, you can move this thing, you know, in any direction, two feet in any direction, and you still got the wire there. You don't got to scrap all that wire and then waste even more wire and rerun it all. So I always, with all my lighting, fans, everything, I always leave a little bit more slack because you run into situations with, when you don't run slack that they want it moved the opposite direction of the slack and you don't have any. So you got to take and unstaple that whole wire and pull everything back out, pull a whole brand new wire in there and all you had to do was leave a little bit of slack to begin with. Now what about the spacing? Like how far should these things go apart? There's not really a rule for that. There's some things that you can use to figure that out if you want like a precise foot candle measurement or anything like that. Um, generally I say whatever the size of the can is, I do that many feet apart, like at a maximum. So this is a six inch can, meaning that this hole is six inches, roughly, probably six and three eighths, or some of them are six and a quarter. Just depends on the brand and the style. Um, but generally with a six inch can, I'll put them uh, at most six feet apart. You can go eight feet, you can go 10 feet, it doesn't really matter. But my ideology is out of this thing, it's a circle, right? So it's gonna put down on the ground a circle of light. And if you put the cans too far apart, you're gonna see on the floor, circle, circle, circle. And in between them, there's gonna be areas that aren't really lit as well. You'll be able to notice a difference. And with lighting, I prefer to put lighting in so it kind of washes the area evenly. That's just what, what I think looks good, where you can't really tell there's any difference in which light is coming from which you know can. Um, so I find that six inch cans going six feet apart or less um, but generally six feet, five feet, whatever, within six feet is, is the best lighting. It's the lighting I like. Um, with five inch cans, five feet, uh, four inch cans, four feet, three inch cans, three feet, um, you can stretch that. It doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you could probably take three inch cans and put them five feet apart. Some of the, the uh, metrics for which kind, you know, which angle that beam is coming out because everything comes out conically, you know, it doesn't come straight down. Uh, most light spreads when it hits the ground. There's ways to figure that out. If you want to be super scientific about it, I'm sure there's better advice out there than the six inch to six foot, five inch to five foot rule. That's just what I've noticed works for me. Um, so that's what I stick with. 
Now, when you're bringing your wires into the can, make sure that you don't strip too much wire out. This happens a lot with brand new helpers if you don't tell them and then double check them. They will run the Romex in here and they'll strip out like two inches of the black and two inches of the white. And then they'll try to stick them in this connector and then you've got all this, this uh, conductor that's a live conductor when the lights get turned on, exposed. So once you've got sheetrock up, this is all you have to work with, this hole. All the rest of this is sheetrock. So how do you get to the junction box from below when there's sheetrock? That's the shitty part, is you, you have to deconstruct this whole can, pull this insert out from below, pull everything out and try to get access to this side of the junction box because this is removable as well. And you gotta work off of a ladder within this tiny little space. So getting this right is a really huge thing. You don't want breakers tripping because you've got copper wire exposed and it's touching the metal and it blows up every time you turn the, turn the light on. So uh, strip out very little wire, make sure, not very little, strip. you know, I, I'd say like three eighths of an inch is really all you need. Um, half inch maybe, but that's, that's cut, that's getting close. If you look, these from the factory, the insulation goes all the way into this Wago. This is called a Wago. Um, so yours should be the same way. There just shouldn't be any copper sticking out. Um, the other thing that's really important to do on cans is these are manufactured in mass, in quantity. So quality assurance, you know, like one out of every 150 or one out of a thousand of these might be checked. So what I do is when I put a new can in, I actually push these in all the way and you can look because the tops are clear. You can see if that conductor is actually all the way in touching the metal that's inside of this thing. And if it's not, chances are this light's just going to be dead. It might pass current through to the next one, but you're, you're going to be troubleshooting this and like, why is this one off? It's a good idea to check these things. And even if you just open up a brand new can, usually there's six of them in a box, take every single one of them, just open them, push them in, and then go and start putting them up. It's just a good habit to get into. It's an extra step, sure, but holy shit, will it save you a lot of time and money if you didn't do it. Another tip with cans, um, sometimes you have to slam cans. Um, so usually when you're measuring off of something, if it's right next to the stud or right next to the truss, you're gonna write slam, meaning you are slamming that can all the way against the wood. You don't have to pull it off and take a measurement and make sure that it's in a specific place. You're just slamming it. But a lot of times with the way that the hardware is and these little extra bits that stick out, you can't get it close. You can actually get another quarter inch, which a lot of times will help um, if you smash these little tabs in. Now I'm sure from manufacturer, they probably don't want you doing that, but there's never in my life been a problem with doing it. So um, I actually will edit the can sometimes to get it closer. And uh, I've even had to take this flange and bend it down at 90 degrees because I needed to get even closer. And it was just in a pinch situation. So I bent this whole thing down and then it actually lets you get up to the can. So you might have to edit the arms to you know, allow that to happen, but just some little tricks that if you're trying to get something to line up and you just need a, a hair, like a half inch closer. The last bit of advice that I will give you on recessed cans is always, once you've installed all of them, pull a laser out. I keep a cross line laser that will shoot a laser in three different directions. So it shoots a line out in front, it shoots a line across, and it shoots a line sideways. And so when you look up in the ceiling, you've got a cross. Um, well, it, yeah, it would be across this way. So you can see, you can line up with one can perfectly, but you can also line up with the one over there and the one down and just make sure that everything is perfectly straight. Very important when you have a hallway. So if you got a hallway with like 13 cans all in a row, take a laser and set that thing on the ground and shoot up a line all the way down that hallway. You'd be surprised at how many times you are off like a quarter inch or a half inch side to side on all of these and they need to be perfectly straight. It doesn't matter so much usually if you're, you know, a half inch to an inch off front to back, depending on the situation, depending on the height of the lights, all that. Most people aren't going to notice that, but they will definitely notice if you've got like these perfect cans and then one's just like, eh, and the other ones keep going. Um, so that's my tips for recessed cans. Let me know if you guys have any other tips or uh, tricks or anything that you do with new construction cans. I'll do a, uh, a video on remodel cans to come.